All right, well, we will go ahead and get going. Um, welcome everybody who is uh, watching us live on our Facebook, uh, Facebook page. My name is uh, Stephen Fearing, and uh, I am a Presbyterian minister and uh, co-founder of the Clergy Emergency League. And uh, we'll give uh, just a, a really brief uh, introduction on, on the work that we do at the Clergy Emergency League before I introduce um, our, our special neighbor, uh, guest today, Tom, Tom Juno. Uh, the Clergy Emergency League was founded in June of this year, a few months ago. Um, and to give a little bit of the background of who we are, uh, back in the 1930s, uh, there was a guy by the name of Adolf Hitler uh, who rose to power in Germany. And he had a knack of, of using Christianity to try to, uh, to further his, his policies of violence and oppression. And uh, a lot of Christians in Germany thought that he was a great guy, and they, they did not see any problem with uh, giving their allegiance uh, to, to Adolf Hitler. Uh, they did not see any, any problem with the policies of the Third Reich and, uh, and the, the, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, not all Christians saw it that way. A group of, of Christians uh, had the audacity to say that, no, uh, it is not okay um, that Adolf Hitler and his policies are in fact blatantly antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ as we read it. And they uh, got together and uh, formed a, a resistance movement and uh, ended up uh, writing a confession that we call the Barman Declaration. Um, but anyways, this group of pastors in, the, in 1930s Germany uh, called themselves the Pastors Emergency League. And here we are in 2020, and, and in that spirit, we have created something called the Clergy Emergency League, which is simply a grassroots group of clergy uh, we are seeking to support and uh, to, to learn from one another uh, in this, in this crazy, uh, this, this very divisive, volatile atmosphere and trying to figure out how we can be true to our callings as, as, as preachers and to speak into those spaces, uh, with, to our, to our congregants. Um, so in that light, um, seeking to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly, as Micah 6, 8 teaches us, um, we, we have, uh, we have invited my friend Tom. So Tom, welcome. Uh, great, grateful to have you uh, with us. I'm hoping this is less of an interview and more of just kind of a conversation. Tom, I hope so too. Uh, it's, it's great to it's great to be with you, Stephen. I miss you. I, you know, I know, miss you too. Stephen and I know each other through uh, when Stephen was a pastor at, in Shelter Island, New York. Uh, we've had Stephen over to dinner a bunch of times. I've been to his house for dinner and his incredible smoked uh, concoctions, and uh, I miss you. And Trisha. For, for the record, those smoked concoctions were, were food. Just uh, just, <laughs> you know, just make sure everybody wanna know that. Uh, yeah, you, we, we first met when, you know, I think it was the, the summer of 2014. And um, yeah. I, I, didn't know, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I, and for the record, I still don't, but uh, I was fresh out of seminary. I had literally had just gotten out of seminary and that was my first call. And uh, I got to know you and uh, your wonderful wife, uh, Janet and, and daughter Nia. And, uh, and it was uh, during this time that I learned that, uh, you know, I was getting to know you, that you had um, uh, a, a relationship, a friendship with, with, uh, with Fred Rogers and that that was a friendship that has changed your life. You, you write that he is the first, uh, I mean, you, you are uh, an artist of words, a, 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 a writer, and you have interviewed, I'm sure, countless people, but he was the first, or so you say, that became your friend uh, from, yes, from, right. from uh, interviewing him. So, so for those who, who might be unfamiliar, would you please just, just kind of share with us, how did you first cross paths with Mr. Rogers? Well, sure. Um, I was working for Esquire magazine at the time. And um, I was about a year into that job. I had, I had come from uh, GQ, where I everything just was roses when I was at GQ. Everything went so well. I mean, and, and I, you know, I, I really, um, you know, I, I was in that I was in the habit of, of, you know, topping myself as a journalist, like what, what was he going to do this time? And, and, yeah. um, and really, you know, setting up that expectation for myself. And so when I went to Esquire, I put tremendous pressure on myself. Hmm. So like, you know, because I had, you know, I'd come, I'd come to Esquire with some fanfare. And so I put tremendous pressure on myself to do myself. exactly what so I've been doing at GQ, but even take it further. 
And so for my first story um, at Esquire, uh, I wrote about Kevin Spacey, the actor. And um, uh, for my next trick, um, I, um, with coy rhetorical devices that masked, that gave me an out, but really didn't, um, you know, I outed him. Mm -hmm. And um, man, uh, you know, my, my winning streak ended uh, all in one shot. Um, it, was um, it was uh, a reviled um, journalistic stunt, and um, you know all the all the the momentum that I had been building at at, at GQ sort of sort of died, and um, I lost my confidence, and I lost my confidence in myself. I lost, you know, I mean, uh, when you're a journalist, you when, when you lose people's trust, you realize what an underrated commodity trust is. And when you lose trust in yourself, you realize what an underrated commodity trust is. I, I imagine there's many uh, pastors that have learned that um, as right. well. Sure. Right. And, um, and then, so ab about a year later, when I was really just, really just really struggling and really trying to find, you know, trying to find my way how do you, you know, keep on topping yourself when you've topped yourself right into the tank? You know, mm -hmm. what do you do? Um, I was assigned to uh, write about Fred Rogers and I did not, you know, I was, I was not a Fred Rogers guy. I didn't, I was a little bit too old for Fred Rogers. And you yeah. know, when I was, I think that he kind of, I was about 12 when he went, you know, big and national around the same time as Sesame Street. And, um, you know, for me, for a 12 year old boy, this guy with the sweater and the sneakers was, um, I think Namby Pamby was the, was the mm. word that, that we, mm. we used back then. It was just, you know, who is this guy? He wasn't, he wasn't for you. He was for children. Mm. And, um, but I was assigned uh, that story for an issue that we did on American heroes. And the editors and uh, some people at the at the magazine had gotten into their heads that he was an American hero. And I, and I think that my editor uh, was a wonderful guy. He's a great, great editor, David Granger, really wanted to see what was going to happen. I think, mm. I think he looked at it as a the kind of volatile mix that would make good for good journalism. You hear you had, you know, the nicest man in the world meeting, you know, bad boy journalist, um, Tom <laughs> Joe. And I went and... Um, I don't know if any, any of you guys have, have seen um, It's a Beautiful, you know, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, the movie with Tom Hanks and Matthew Reese. Um, it was a little bit different than that in that I wasn't as angry as Matthew was in the movie, but... You never, you never got into an actual fist fight with your father, correct? And I never got into an actual fist fight with my dad, but... The, the, you know, the meeting with Fred was something, you know, I'll, I'll never forget. You know, I, I called him from uh, our office in New York and he mm -hmm. happened to be, <laughs> I happened to be calling him around the block. He had an apartment on 56th street. Hmm. So I walked around the corner and went upstairs and, you know, he had warned me on the phone, you know, you know, Tom, I'm, I'm going to be in my bathrobe. I was trying to take a nap, you know, and, <laughs> and I went over there and you know, sure enough, Mr. Rogers you know, uh, answers the door in his bathrobe, and and then I I, I sit I sit down, and and <laughs> he you know he starts asking me you know Tom did you because I started asking him about his childhood you know of course you're going to ask Fred Rogers about his childhood but he was not interested in answering my questions at all he was very interested in asking me about my childhood Tom did you did you have a a special toy that meant a lot to you and I was like you know. <laughs> Yes, Fred. Did that toy have a name? Yes, Fred. What was the name of the toy? <laughs> Old Rabbit. Oh, I'll bet you had him when he was a very young rabbit. <laughs> and it just, it just went on. And I'm, you know, I mean, was that, was that, uh, I mean, it sounds like to you, it was, it was disarming. Uh, oh, it was disarming. But the thing about Fred is that he had this tremendous, tremendous natural authority which is something that the, that the movie captures really, really well. I mean, you just didn't, you just didn't say no to him. And when he, when, he, when he asked you a question, 
he wasn't just making small talk. He wasn't asking questions for the sake of asking questions. He was asking questions for the sake of getting an answer. And he put you on the spot every mm -hmm. single time. And I was there and, and, you know, and I'm practically, you know, sobbing, talking about, you know, old rabbit as this sort of lost piece of childhood innocence. And then I'm, you know, and I'm, and his apartment is quite dark at this time. And he goes, well, wait a second, Tom, because I, I, I really like to, you know, introduce Joanne to my new friends. So I'm going to call, <laughs> I'm going to call Joanne. And he calls Joanne. And when I'm on the phone with Joanne, he goes, can I take your picture, Tom? <laughs> and he takes this picture of me while I'm talking to Joanne. And it was, it was so disorienting. It was so unlike anything that I had ever gone through mm -hmm. that, um, I mean, the, the biggest difference between the movie and real life was, I mean, I, I, I did know that I had a live one. You know, I mean, it wasn't, yeah. I hadn't lost all of my journalistic instincts. I knew that this was going to be a different experience and was quite determined to go for the ride. But um, that's, that's how it all began. And uh, Fred and I, I went and wound up seeing Fred. So I'm in New York, so I'm the next day, went down to um, Pennsylvania to see him on the set, went again to see him. Um, um, when we, he took a, a, he decided to take a drive into Latrobe to show me his house, his childhood house, and all, also the, the cemetery where he was going to, where he was going to be buried. And um, where, where you I saw, saw him, him, I saw him again, him, you know, right? after that. Hmm? Did you, uh, did he uh, have to excuse himself to go uh, relieve him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I actually, you know, I mean, I, I've seen, I've seen Fred Rogers stark naked in the, in the locker room at the, at the Pittsburgh Athletic Club when he was getting dressed to go swimming. And I've seen, um, I've seen Fred Rogers pee. <laughs> so, so have, have seen Fred Rogers stark naked, you can, you can confirm that he does not have tattoos up and down his arms. He definitely uh, does not. I, I am, I think of anybody of all the authorities on Fred, I'm the one most qualified to say he was not <laughs> tattooed. Yeah. So you knew Fred, he, Fred found you. He did. In the last, what, four years of his life? Four or five yeah. years of his life? Five years. Um, it was, no, well, actually four, it was 90, it was 98 through 2002. Yeah. I, I want to start off a little bit by, by, by quoting you in the article that you read, that you wrote, um, that you wrote, uh, last year, uh, kind mm -hmm. of a revisitation. I think you wrote this for the Atlantic. It was. Um, and, and I just want to read this paragraph that you, that, that you wrote about Fred toward, towards the end. You, you, you say this. As for Fred, it's true that he lost and that the digitization of all human endeavor has devoured his legacy as, e as eagerly as it has devoured anything else, everything else. But that he stands at the height of his reputation 16 years after his death shows the persistence of a certain kind of human hunger, the hunger for goodness. He had faith in us. And even if his faith turns out to have been misplaced, even if we have abandoned him, he somehow endures, standing between us and our electrified antipathies and recriminations like the tank man of Tiananmen Square in a red sweater. He is a warrior, all right, because he is not just unarmed, outgunned, outnumbered. He is long gone, and yet he keeps up the fight. When I read that that paragraph that you wrote, it, it 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 makes me feel like, and maybe this isn't the best verb, but that Fred Rogers still haunts us. I don't mean mm, sure. I don't I don't mean that verb is some sort of you know uh, creepy verb or whatnot. But his no no I know but, I know but but, yeah, but, I but his ghost lingers. Um, and I think for, for those of, you know, the, the audience that we have people, we have lots of different people uh, watching right now, but, but the majority of them are, are preachers. Um, and, and, and I think that many of us preachers are fascinated by, by Fred Rogers because, you know, I, I see a lot of connection between what he did and his ministry and what we are called to do. Um, when, when Fred, you know, as, I, as you write, 
what it, what initially compelled Fred to create his own television show was he was so dismayed and disgusted by the children's television programming of that day. Um, well, what 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 was it that he that he hated about? Uh, I, I I really can't use that verb with him, although I'm sure he felt hate. But uh, what what was it about the the children's programming of the day that really irked him? Um, he um. I mean, I mean, just I mean, on on the most basic level, he 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 watched um, people throwing pies at each other on children's TV, grown men throwing pies at each other, and he was dismayed. I think dismayed is the is the is the best is the best word to put it because he he felt the potential in the medium. He felt the potential mm. in the medium to um, reach out to people and to connect people. And to, I mean, listen, I mean, he, he was, you know, Fred, Fred very rarely um, spoke explicitly in any arena about God, but he did speak often about what was sacred. Hmm. And he, he believed that the space between the television screen and a child could be sacred space, yeah. and and he so was, he when, was doing virtual ministry before it was cool. That's exactly right, and and so when when I wrote in that the Atlantic piece a year ago that Fred has lost, that's what that's what I was referring to. I wasn't referring that his battle, you know, for kindness was lost. I was referring sure. that that you know sure. that specific mission, which he took upon himself, um, that profoundly countercultural mission. Mm -hmm you know, has not been, there is no one to follow him in it, you know, I mean, and I mean, there's lots of people doing good, but someone with that power and that audience doing good on that scale, mm -hmm. you know, we just don't, we just don't have, we just don't have that. And, I, you know, and I, and I think of it, I think of it all the time. I, I think of Fred all the time in terms of, in terms of where we are with social media, um, and just how hostile and unfriendly mm -hmm. social media really is. I mean, even among friends. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, people people lose friends that they've had for fifty years. How about family and, that they've had for? 50 they, and years family, too. and exactly yeah. friends and friends and family members and neighbors. And the, 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 so the space. And, oh, sorry. Go tough. ahead. Yeah. It's it's just a, it's a, it's a very you know we're in a very tough place and I, and I feel myself reaching for Fred. Mm. I, you know, I feel myself, I, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm very this way and that on, on, on prayer, but I, I, when I pray, I mean, I often ask, you know, in, ter in the spirit of Fred, what, you know, what do I do now? What can we do? Where, where are we? And, and, you know, how can you follow, how can you follow his tracks mm when you know hatred is by far the most convenient response on social media or anger at least maybe not hatred but anger at least yeah i i think that we are living in such loud loud times where and you're right anger uh which is usually the byproduct of fear my my child psychologist of a wife will will remind me of that yeah um is is so pervasive right now that i think that many of us uh, you know when, when when fred saw this this, this television program for children that was loud, profane, disrespectful, instead of adding to the noise, he stepped into that loud space. He stepped into that mm -hmm. arena yeah. and provided an, an alternative way of, of ministry uh, that was sub subversive, as you say, counter countercultural, and, and I, he must have felt weary uh, stepping into that space. And I think that for, for many of us preachers who are called to the pulpit week in and week out to our congregations in this particular time and place, we feel distraught. We feel like we are like, like you know, is there a place for the message of the gospel in, in such an ethos of hatred and, and, and racism and toxic masculinity and, and, you know, all these things that just seem to be so big and we feel so small. Is there a place for that 
gentle but ferocious love of Mr. I mean, Rogers. I think that there, you know, I think that there, ha I think that there has to be, you know, and, and I think that that is the message of, of Fred, you know, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, Fred lived in some halcyon era. He lived in the, in the seventies, eighties, sixties, seventies and eighties. And let's face it, a lot of, a lot of stuff was going down and, and, you know, and, and racism was the, at the time it wasn't, it was the knee jerk reaction of so many people and there wasn't any, even anything said about it. So, I mean, I, but I think that what Fred, what Fred really had going for him was his faith in the ministry of example. Um, I, I think that, you know, I mean, Fred was, Fred was a person who basically did the same thing every day of his life while being open to all sorts of different things. I mean, that show was crazy. I mean, it was open to, it was open to, to, you know, surprises. I mean, the, I mean that, you know, whenever I see, I see Fred, um, so there's two, you know, obviously two movies that came out in the last two years in 2018 and 2019 about Fred Rogers. One was the documentary mm -hmm. and one was the, was the, you know, the live action movie. Um, but in the documentaries, there's, you know, there's a lot of really, you know, won't you be my neighbor? It, there's a lot of really wonderful stuff. And this, the thing that stuns me again and again and again is when he gets into the cage with Coco the gorilla. Yeah. Yeah. And Coco the gorilla. Just, it unties his shoes. Yeah, yeah. Because Coco Gorilla has, you know, has been watching the Fred Rogers show from her. And she knows yeah. that he takes off his shoes. <laughs> I mean, I mean, that is, it is. You have no idea what's going to happen mm -hmm. in that moment, and what happens, of course, is a moment of just, you know, tremendous grace. Mm -hmm. um, but so Fred was this guy who did the exact same thing every moment or every day so that he could be open to every moment of the day. Mm. And, and that's who he was, you know? And I mean, every morning he got up and prayed for people and wrote and read scripture and went to swim and swam for a mile and, you know, went and, you know, contacted friends and this and that. And, you know, it, it was, this life that he tried to reduce to its essence so that its essence would be one of grace. And, and I think that he didn't, you know, I mean, he did it so that he didn't have to speak. He didn't have to argue. Hmm. He was the argument. <laughs> wow. You know, he didn't have to argue. He was the argument. Yeah. Uh, I mean that as a, as a, preacher, um, you know, we, we are obsessed with words. You're a writer. I would imagine you are as well. Um, but Fred taught us that it's about more than words. <laughs> uh, that word, I mean, word, he, words are important. Absolutely important. And he's, a, and he was, listen, I mean, I, I, when I was writing the Atlantic piece, I um, found um, and uncovered all of his correspondence with me. Yeah. And he's a brilliant, brilliant writer. But I, I think that his writing was um, part of his arsenal of gestures. I think that his, you know, that his message was in his gestures as much as it was articulated in his writing. And I think his writing was a gesture as much as, as much as it was a collection of of words. I mean, he he what he used his writing for was to connect with people, to communicate with people, to reach, you know, to reach out to people. And he did that. I mean, his, his, his writing to me is just, it's just so freaking amazing. <laughs> it really is. And in his writing to me, by the way, he is more, he, and, and thanks to some prodding from me, because I was interested, um, he is more of a theological bent than in any other arena that I know him in. In, in his personal correspondence with you? Yes, yes, very much so. What, uh, can you share more, more about that? What's, what's, what, 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 is the, what is the explicit theology of, Miss, of Mr. Rogers? Obviously we got lots of implicit theology through the 
through the television show, but what, what struck you about the theology and his personal letters to you? Well, I, I mean, I was, I was very, I was very um, interested in having him prove to me that God was good and I was worthy of love. I mean, it was quite basic. It wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, you know, we were, we were, you know, discussing the Pelagian heresy, you know, I mean, it was, it was um, you know, he was, here's my dog, by the way. This Dex, is my, is Dex, my guy, Dexter. Dexter, that's right. Hey, Dexter. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he just came in. He just bar barreled his way in here. Um, but, but that question, Tom, is, a t is a, who hasn't asked those questions? Who, who haven't, you know, right. is God good? Right. Am I worthy of love? Okay. Yeah. So what, was, what, would he, what would he tell you? Um, you know, yes. And he would, I, I mean, he was... That's where that's where his his writing, you know, was somehow gestural. You know, it wasn't just like, you know, gee, Tom, don't worry about it. Hmm. It was, you know, you know, gee, Tom, um, you know, I, I, I wish I had I wish I had it all, um, you know, in front of me right now. And if I was if I was smarter, I would but hang on one second. I do have one thing that I, I have easily available to me. Are you there? Can yeah. You see me? Okay. Uh, no, I, I, are you trying to share your screen or something? No, I'm just trying to find something. Yeah. Hang on. You're fine. I do have some things that I can show you. Well, he, yeah. well, well, Tom's looking for that. One of the things I, I love in his article is that you said that, uh, Mr. Rogers, uh, Mr. Rogers email address was ZZZ143 at AOL.com. I always love that little detail, ZZZ, because, because he slept so well every night. And 143, of course, because I has one word or one letter. Uh, love has four letters and you has, has three letters. Uh, and, right. and of course, in, you know, famously, it, he weighed 143 pounds every day of his adult life. And I just love how he, he Fred Rogers seemed to find that kind of, that, quirky symbolism that you know he just found meaning in those little things and they they steered him for his life let it never be said that he wasn't quirky yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was quite quirky yeah. so, um okay so uh last year um and i have this on my desktop my com computer so it was easily available um but last year when i was doing the atlantic piece um one of the screenwriters for a uh, beautiful day in the neighborhood. Noah Harpster sent me um, um, a photograph, screenshot, whatever you want to call it, of notes that he found in Fred's archive hmm. that were in my folder of Fred's archive. Um, notes that he wrote on journalism. And I'm going to read them to you. Um, Journalists are human beings, not automatons, human beings, not stenographers. Journalists have a duty to let their outrage show through when they come across injustice. Journalists need to let their compassion show through for other people's suffering. Hmm. And journalists need to let their ah, wonder, show through when they witness the glory of life they have so much responsibility to celebrate life and they have as much responsibility to celebrate life and the goodness of it as they do to root out evil and so that's and and wow. you know, so fred has if i could if i could just show you these things i mean it's written in this he had the most beautiful handwriting. He had a calligraphic hand. Yeah. And, um, and so it's written in this beautiful handwriting and he clearly just dashed it off. And I, you know, I, I keep that um, on my desktop just to remind me of what he was trying to get me to do and to be. And, you know, I mean, that's not, a, that's an obviously not overtly, you know, theological, but it, you could just as easily call that, the job description of, of, of a preacher. Yeah. Right. Uh, I, they, exactly. they, they, they really, you know, in some ways we are both journalists and preachers. We are, um, 
we're midwives of, of sorts. We, 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 we receive something, uh, in, your, in your case, whoever or, or whatever you're, you're writing about, in the preacher's case, it's the biblical text, we, we receive this gift, and it is our job to, uh, to stand in wonder of it, to allow, uh, to ask questions of it, but just as importantly, to allow it to ask questions of us. Yeah, I think Fred exactly. did that so well, and and, and then we, we we cultivate it, we nourish it, but but we don't own it, right? We 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 right. We, we pass it on, um, and I think I think Fred did that in his ministry. You know, Fred did not create the the emotions of anger and joy and uh, and fear and, and gratitude, but he had this way of of cultivating these truths, these goodness. Uh, this goodness in the midst of injustice and, and to pass it along to us in a way that was just, God, just you know, I mean, I think oh, that no. one of the interesting, I think that one of the interesting things about Fred is that, is that um, anger looms over his work. Interesting. Say more about he that. He is, he, um, he was, and the movie, you know, the movie cat, you know, captures that very, very well. Um, a lot of when he saw that when he's at the piano, you know. Yeah, bah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, you yeah. Know. Fred, you know, Fred did not have an easy childhood. Um, and he was bullied a lot, wasn't he? He was bullied a lot. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's really hard to be bullied a lot without coming out of that without some kind of anger, and um, and you know, a lot of his um, written work and his the dedication of his work was, was towards, you know, exp, you know, teaching children to um, find positive ways to express their feelings and their emotions. And I, I think that, you know, feelings and emotions, you know, I, I know I, I knew him well enough to know that I think that, you know, anger, anger dominated that, that you know, it wasn't just joy. It wasn't just mm. love. I think that anger was the thing that, he had to work through, and that's what he was working through. And so, once again, I think that his his ministry is is very potent for us because it's not yeah. anger free; it's just oh, anger. Goodness, no. I mean, as somebody who 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 did not feel seething anger, could not write the words. What do you do with the mad that you feel right. when you when you feel so bad you could bite when right. the whole wide world seems oh so wrong and nothing you do seems very right? You know. Right. He, even to this day, sometimes when I am just absolutely seething in anger, I will start singing that song. Yeah. Um, because you're right, Fred, Fred understood that we had the capacity to, to choose how we react to, to anger. You know, I was preaching yesterday in the Revised Common Lectionary, it was the parable of the unforgiving servant, the, mm -hmm. the servant who's forgiven sure. a huge amount, and then rather than, you know, pay it forward, he goes and finds somebody who owes him a very small amount, strangles him, says, you know, uh, and uh, we talked about anger. I, I, I think about Fred Rogers whenever, whenever I think about the story of Cain and Abel. If you remember the story of Cain and Abel, uh, Cain was so freaking mad at his brother uh, Abel because he, he never measured up. Uh, God preferred Abel's offerings to Cain, and Cain, yes. was, Cain was insist, and, and we know the story that Cain killed Abel, but there's something that happens before that that I find fascinating. Before Cain does it, God sits down with Cain and says, hey, I see that you're angry, but you have a choice with what you do. And, and God, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit there, but God says to Cain, hey, I, I, I see what's happening. And you have a choice. There's an alternate way than, than killing. Um, and uh, obviously Cain did not take that choice. But I think about Fred, uh, when I think about God and that story about, God, about Fred saying to us, hey, you have emotions. It's anger is not a bad thing. Right. But what makes us human is our capacity to choose what we do. I mean, it's uh, at the end of the song, what do you do with the mad that you feel? He says something like, isn't it nice to know that these feelings are really mine and yeah, that I can choose right. what yeah. to do? And he yeah. says, you know, what do you do when the mad that you feel do, you, uh, you know, he lists off a bunch of nonviolent things, you know, do you pound some clay or some dough or what is it? Uh, 
gather your friends for a uh, game of tag and see how fast yeah. they go. Yeah. We, I feel like we've lost that. I feel like I've lost that. And a part of it is just social media because it's just, it's so easy when you're pissed off just to comment and da -da 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 -da, boom. It's, it's oh, yeah, sure. And, and it's, it's the easier option. I know I'm guilty of it. Um, but, but just to practice the pause and go, Hey, I'm feeling pissed off as hell. And this is my feeling. And I need to spend some time with this feeling before I do anything about it. And that's hard as hell, Tom. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard as, yeah. And, and you, you said before that anger comes from fear. Yep. I mean, I can, I just, I'll tell you flat out. I mean, I am really afraid of what's going to go down in this country for the next, over the next two months. I just I am. am too. And uh, because I don't think that we know. And, you know, if there is, if there is violence done um, from either side, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be really hard to, um, to say, well, well, gee, you know, won't you be my neighbor? And, and like, and all like, you know, where, where do we stand with Fred's teachings then, you know? And, um, but I think that, I think the thing about Fred that I think that we're really trying to, to get at is that, you know, I think that, that a lot of people like to think of Fred as this sort of neutered kind of being hmm. um, that he was, you know, not, you know, by an example of, uh, you know, when people looking at, at him in terms of what he was not, rather than what he was, and, you know, that he, he kept away from, from, you know, dark and deep waters, when in fact, I mean, he lived there, mm. he, you know, he lived in those, he lived in those waters, but he, you know, he found a way to swim. And actually, and what somebody just asked a question in the comment section uh, about burnout, uh, about us feeling those of us pastors that are in those dark, dark, deep waters, as you say, as Fred was. Uh, and one of the questions from from Brendan here is, do you think Mr. Rogers ever felt burnout? Did he ever talk to you about that? Or did you ever get the sense that that there were days that he just didn't feel like he was up to the task? I mean, what do you? Yeah, what, I, I think that there think were many. Of, I think that there were many of those days. I mean, I didn't really. I didn't really see them because Fred was not, you know, I mean, I mean, I, I, I had a chance to, you know, to look firsthand at Fred's example, but I didn't get, I didn't get much past that. <laughs> you know, I mean, Fred was not really particularly interested in, in opening his soul to me. He showed me, you know, he tried to show me my soul. So I didn't, I didn't really, you know, um, get that out of Fred, like, you know, gee, I'm, I'm angry today, but, but you could, but you could see it. And, and I think that, you know, that Joanne is, you know, is quite, is quite frank, you know, about, about all that. But I, I, I do think that Fred had like a secret weapon against burnout. And that was, he was so willing to be, you know, for, for a guy who was as, driven by routine and discipline as he was, he had this capacity to be surprised mm. and to allow himself to be surprised that, you know, I'm, I remember when, when, um, when I went to the athletic club with him, you know, there was a, there was the, the, the guy who was the, the towel, the towel guy was, you know, he was an, he was, and he was autistic and, you know, and he was, Fred had known him for years and he would but just come right up to you, you know, and, and, and Fred made sure to introduce me to him, you know, and, and this guy comes up to me and he was like, who are you? You know, he was just like, no, you know, no, no filter whatsoever. And I said, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm Fred's friend. Are you a priest? No, I'm not a priest. You should be a priest. And then, and, and just Fred, Fred's face lit up, you know, so much. And he was like, <laughs> you know, and he was like, "Did you hear that, Tom?" You know, and, <laughs> and it was it was so funny, but it was it was, I mean, it was very funny to be because it was like, like everything that happened when I was with Fred seemed to happen by Fred's will, you know. Mm -hmm. So of course, of course, the the guy comes up to me and says, "You know, you should be a priest," and 
but at the same time, just watching the, you know, the, the childlike, you know, joy that, that, mm. that Fred, that Fred thought was as much part of his ministry as the example of, and, you know, and, and like, you know, how to, how to find a healthy role for your emotions. Mm. You know, yesterday, uh, when you and, you and I chatted on the phone a few minutes yesterday, I, I shared with you something that I'm, that I'm learning as, as a preacher, as a pastor, as a human being trying to navigate this world that we're living in, um, is that uh, the antidote to despair is wonder. And, I, and, I and, and wonder leads to gratitude. It, yeah. um, or gratitude yeah. leads to wonder. I, I don't know, but but um, but that capacity just to constantly be able to say this this is something new. This is something wonderful. This is something that I'm learning. Um, you know, children get that because everything's new as a child. Right. Uh, but you're a right. tiny little child, and the world is so friggin' huge, and 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 we forget what that's like. It, it, except Fred. Fred didn't. And I think he never did. Was, I think... he, he never did. I mean, you know, I, I, I do, I do believe that he carried a burden. Yeah. And I, I think but... that's why uh, maybe, th do you think that's why there's this resurgence in, in appreciation of and fascination with Fred Rogers right now? I mean, I don't think it's a coincidence that, that, you know, this you, Donald Trump gets elected. And, and, and we, we really descend into this, this, this just exhausting place of so much pain and so much fear. Um, and now we look back at, you know, the ghost of Mr. Rogers visits us again. And I think a lot of us who, I, I grew up with Mr. Rogers, you know, I, I, I grew up and I was born in, in 88. Uh, so I remember watching Mr. Rogers is I think some of us now that are so scared, I know I'm filled with fear. I want to get back to that sense of wonder. I, and I, I yeah, think, I think I mean, Fred, Fred calls us, he calls us back to that, don't he, you think? He does. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing, because I mean, like the minute, the minute you said, you know, if Trump gets elected again, you know, there's a dissent. I mean, the thing that, the thing that I find And I'm going to use the word that I that I that, that I want to contest, but the thing that I find unforgivable, and I use that word a lot with with Trump, is that he has at this moment when this country is teetering on the brink, he has decided to double down on divisiveness in order to you know to try to win re-election. And I you know I've certainly never experienced anything like that in my lifetime, and. Um, but that question, I mean, you know, what is, what is unforgivable and what is, what is, you know, my right to be even able to say that I'll never forgive Trump for, um, you, you asked me, you asked me yesterday, you know, how do I think that Fred would, would contend with Donald Trump? Well, we haven't, I think we have, partial answer in that Joanne came out last week and spoke quite openly about him that she, you know, she thought that he was psychologically ill, you know, that he was sick. And I, I, I do, I do agree with that. Um, but does that, you know, present all the more reason to, you know, to forgive him? And, and so a lot of the, a lot of the language that we, associate with Fred, kindness, you know, forgiveness, wonder, all those things. I mean, it's not just, it's not just Fred's lessons that are being tested right now. It's, it's the very, it's, you know, his, his toolkit mm -hmm. is being tested. It's not just, I mean, the very concepts for which he stood, not just him, but the concepts for which he stood are being tested. So, so when you first met Fred, he prodded you about your childhood, as he probably did with, with many adults. Um, he was able to see the child in, in all of us because he remembered the child within him. Um, I, think, I think Daniel Tiger 
I, is the is the epitome yeah. of of yeah. of Fred as a child. But uh, it is. So if if he sat down with Donald Trump, I you think he would try to find the child in Donald Trump? I do. I do. I, I think I think he he would do that because I think that number one he did it with, I mean he was he was a, a creature of consistency, mm. and he you know he he did it with everybody you know it was his superpower so I, I I can't see him I can't see him not doing it and making an exception for this guy no matter what he really thought about him. But I, I, I do think that he would try to try to minister to him and just say, what's, what's wrong? <laughs> why, why are you so angry? You know, what's, what, what, what happened to you, you know? And, um, you know, and, and I think that he would, you know, you saw, there's that, there's the, you know, the very famous, um, episode caught on camera where he's speaking to the senator from the, you know, state of, is it from Illinois or from Pennsylvania? I, I forget Sorry, which. I can't, can't remember. Um, but anyway, he's, you know, he, he has a guy coming after him in his face. And Fred asks for that moment. And the, you know, the song that does it are the lyrics for the mad that you feel. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think, I think the reason that Fred Rogers haunts haunts me is because he demands so much of us. And I, I, that's one of the things I loved in your, I can't remember if it was your 98 article or your article last year where you say it's much easier to think of Fred, Fred, Fred Rogers as a nice guy. Yeah, that than, was last year. Than, was than, last year. than a demanding one. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that he does ask a lot of us and, and, and I'm, I'm grateful as I'm teaching and preaching and, 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 and trying to navigate this world, I'm grateful that Fred Rogers is haunting me. And I'll, I'll give you an example of, he haunted me today, okay? So I went to Costco today, cause it's, it's soup season. It's gonna be soup chili. Uh, so I went to go get you know, all the garbanzo beans and diced tomatoes <laughs> and all that stuff. Cause I'm, I'm all, about, <laughs> all about crock pots. Um, anyway, so I was, I was walking out of Costco to today and I saw a man with a mask on that, that, that was, it was a MAGA mask. It said, make America great again. And as I, pa as I passed him, I thought, I'm not going to repeat what I thought about this man. I will simply say it was a very ungracious, horrible thought mm -hmm. that I had. <clears throat> and I, because of that just that whenever I see those that phrase I just I'm trick you know anyways but and then I realized I got into my car I looked in in the in the in the rearview mirror and I realized what shirt I was wearing today which is this shirt right here <laughs> right 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 and and I had a moment of 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 guilt of of irony of of just wondering of, of of how that gut reaction for me was just happened so quick and and that and that and that me is here so oh Steve, hey, pastor yeah. steven hey Hi. mia good to see ya <laughs> uh that that fred was able to train himself to initially see the child and i, I was just wondering what if what if I was able to train myself to see the child in that man before I have that thought? Now, granted, I didn't act on it, um, but still, that that anger manifests itself in other ways. And and I think Fred was was he was able to do that. And and I, Fred didn't come up with that though. You know, I was reading. Um, no, not at I all. I was reading uh, a few weeks ago. I was I was reading John Lewis's memoir, uh, Walking with the Wind. Um, and he goes into detail about talking about the practices of nonviolence uh, and, and the work that he did with, the, with, with SNCC, the, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And when they were training to do protests, they trained themselves to act nonviolently. And in the book, um, John Lewis says that, that the, one of the core principles of, you know, when someone is beating you or snubbing out a lit cigarette on the back of your neck or whatever, 
that you have to train yourself to literally, literally visualize that person as an infant, mm -hmm. as the infants that they used to be, pure and innocent as you are, and that if, if you're able to visualize that in your head, that is how you resist the very human urge to lash out again. And I think Fred knew that, and I think he passed that along to us. And that's a lesson that, that we're haunted by because the opportunities abound these days, do they not? Yeah, Fred's, Fred's example, um, you know, is, is haunting. Um, I, am, I am very aware of how much he gave me. And because I'm aware of that, I mean, I, I think a lot of, you know, what, gee, Fred, what, what do you expect of me? You know, you know, what, what, what's my next move? And, um, you know, it's a, it's a, that's a conversation I have with myself, you know, an awful lot. Um, because he, he, and I, and I do, you know, I mean, listen, I mean, you talk about John Lewis, you talk about Fred Rogers, I mean, you know, it's it, we're having a pastoral conversation, so I might as well say it. But I mean, I think that I mean a lot of that is, I'm sure, not so different than than what the disciples thought when they were around Jesus. Like, what do you expect from me? Mm. You know, and I, I, you know, I don't want to compare Fred to Jesus. Obviously, Fred's, you know, Fred's a Fred's a man, and so was John Lewis, and in my opinion, so was Jesus. But um, you know. Um, you know, I mean, when, and, and you, you say, you know, you, when you read the gospels, you, you, you sense their confusion <laughs> all yeah. the time. Yep. What, what does this, what does this guy want from me? Hmm. And the fact that, that those men are able to instill that confusion I mean, it's kind of a wonderful thing. That confusion is not a bad thing. Hmm. Yeah, I think that for those of us that are teaching and preaching these days, we are, <laughs> it, it can be a tricky thing because I, we have colleagues here in the Clergy Emergency League um, who have literally uh, been, been accosted by their congregations or by congregants literally for just reading the gospel just, just reading the words of christ pisses off some people these days to mm. the point wow. that, that that clergy have have gotten pushed back uh simply be, uh, for, because jesus was a socialist or jesus was a yada yada, yada wow you know and, and i think that we are just in this in this space where yeah. as as preachers the message of, of, of Jesus Christ just seems so such a dangerous thing right now. Uh, and it's, it's hard to preach the message of Jesus Christ into a space where that same message has been co-opted by the so-called evangelical right wing of Christianity. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and we see, you know, I think what, what incensed us the most that, that, that made us so fearsome was when he, you know, used violent means on peaceful protesters to a church unannounced, and he held up a Bible. And and we see that, and and we know that that Trump's followers just just love that because they just mm. they they see yeah. him as a godly yeah. man that that lit, that God literally sent to save well, they, this country. Yeah, they see him as God's warrior. And, you know and, that he's yeah that he's a, a an im. The, the very his imperfections are actually the signature of God, which is just you know, you know that you know that that he couldn't given his given his flaws he couldn't be where he is sure. without God's imprimatur. And I, I think for those of us who are preaching these days, um, that it's a dangerous thing to 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 preach prophetically when many of us many of our congregants. Um, have have bought into this this narrative um and and i think uh i i think that that fred rogers he knew i think he knew that people some people found him laughable i think he knew that yeah. some people found his his version of 
of of masculinity as just weird and unthinkable and weak and yet that did not deter his message um no not at all he he had this sort of i think i think you and i were talking yesterday about how mr rogers taught us about emotional resiliency mm-hmm. um and I, I think we all need that right now. Those that are called to teach and preach, those that are called to, to write words of truth. Uh, and I, I'm just wondering, what, what do you do as somebody who has learned from, from, from Fred so much? How, how do you stay emotionally resilient? You, you personally, Tom Juno, these days, you know, we started off our conversation yesterday on the phone. You know, how are you doing, Tom? And you said, Phew, Stephen. It's yeah. a tough world right now. Um, what 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 are some practices that you do that keep you that that build up your emotional resiliency? That's interesting. Um, you know, I, I you know, I try to stay in in. I try to stay physical. You know, I try to I, like like when I was in Shelter Island this summer. And the thing about Shelter Island this summer, it was it was crowded and that there was tons of people there from New York city. And yet it was like abandoned. There was, I mean, I would walk around at night. There was nobody out. There was nothing open. There was nobody out. And, and, and yet, you know, I, I try to, I I try to be out. I mean, I think that Fred was, you know, he, he was very attuned to the fact that, you know, you found God in, in places where you don't expect to. Um, and, you know, to me, to me, the thing that, I mean, you, you know, you find God in the dark, um, you find God in silence and you, and you find him in other people. So, you know, during the, the lockdown, um, I, you know, I, I've, a lot of people I know have experienced a lot of loss. And so, you know, I, I try to, you know, I, I make them chickens, <laughs> you know, I, 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 you know, I've been, I've been just, you know, kind of every week I've been, you know, bringing chickens over to people's and, and I just, you know, I try to, I try to connect with people even just through what we're doing now. I try to connect with people, you know, on, on zoom and to, you know, and, and to laugh, you know, um, you know, with people, the people I know who have exper- experienced really extreme loss, you know, sometimes they're not particularly interested in some guy calling up and saying, how are you? You know, they're, they're interested in, in just talking about the same shit that they've been talking about forever. And that, and, you know, that, that great, that great privilege to just talk about nothing, <laughs> with, with friends. And so, you know, those are the things that I, I try to do, you know, I mean, I I have a, I have a lot of friends and, you know, they really keep me going. And, you know, I mean, I'm lucky enough to have a lot of friends right where, where I'm sitting, you know, I'm, you know, my wife, my daughter, big Dexter, you know, my dog. I mean, you know, I, I wrestle with Dexter every night, you know, and, um, you know, he expects that because I'm the, I'm the, I'm the other dog in the house, you know, <laughs> so he, he expects me to come over and mess with him. And so I do. And, you know, those are the things it's not, it's nothing's big. Um, but I try to do that. You know, I'm also trying to write this book on my dad, which mm-hmm. is, you know, very, very hard. And, um, and I've, you know, I've, I've, you know, I've kept at it, even though I, I went and, you know, my, my first draft was not particularly successful. And so um, now I'm kind of back at it. And, you know, I, I found, I found the voice for the book when I got, I got sick over the summer. I thought I had COVID for sure. It turned out to be a tick bite, but I was sick as a dog. I mean, I was, I was shaking so badly. I couldn't take my own temperature. Hmm. And um, during that time, I, you know, I found the voice for my book, you know, and you just, you know, I mean, one of Fred's, th- okay, okay, here's, here's my, here's my message because Fred, Fred's, 
the thing that he lived by, and we, and we talked about his willingness to be open to things, what he always said to his friends, especially skeptical friends, was, you see, you never know. And, and that's, you know, that's what he said, you know, when mm. after, when my story came out, the story that his major domo, Bill Eisler, did not want him to cooperate with, <laughs> he, looked at, he looked at Bill and said, see, Bill, you never know. Wow. And, and, I, and I think that... Because he, he didn't, he didn't, Bill Eisler did not want you to interview uh No, he Fred, thought right? Fred was crazy. Because he thought that you were going to treat him the way that you treated Kevin Spacey or well, whatever. I mean, listen, all of my work at, at that time was really, really tough. Yeah. It was really, really, it was de definitely, I, you know, I, I took pride in saying things about people that nobody else would say. Hmm. And that kind of drove a lot of it. And, you know, Fred, Fred taught me how to say something else. Wow. You know, wow. and um, but the the idea that you know you never know is something of a. Uh, I I too am willing to be surprised. Yeah, well, yeah, I was about to say to 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 say you never know, is a is a it's it's an acknowledgement that that you are open to surprise, that you're open to learning, that you're open to, and and that's that's something that I think we 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 need to be holding on to. Uh, right now. Um, I want to ask you another, actually, I want to open up some questions uh, sure. from, uh, from our commenters. Um, there's a bit of a lag. So right now, if you're watching right now, and there is a question that you would like to ask Tom, uh, I can't promise that we'll get, get to all of them, because I do realize that we're kind of, uh, you know, we're past an hour, but we're going to hang out here for a little bit. Um, so if you have any questions for Tom, please type them into the comment section. I'm going to take a break and get a glass of water. Okay, while we're doing perfect. Okay. All right, go ahead and do that. So uh, while Tom's uh, getting hydrated, uh, if y'all have any questions for Tom, uh, specifically about, you know, his, his, his relationship with uh, Fred Rogers or, or how, you know, the, the ministry of Fred Rogers intersects with our calling for those of us who are teachers and preachers, um, go ahead and put those in now. So while, while people are, are I'm on I, Dexter's bed right now, by the way. are you serious? Oh, it's very nice of him to, uh, to loan it to you. Uh, it, while we're giving people a chance to type in some questions, um, I joined a club that you are currently in, uh, that you've been in for some time, and that's the club of parenthood. Um, your, uh, your, your daughter, Nia is a, uh, a junior, I think. She's and, 17 uh, years old. 17. Um, Trisha, say hi to Tom. Hi, Trish. Hi, how you doing? You can sit and join us if you want. Yeah, um, and out, and we just had our our first child. Um, I know. Who is she sleeping? She's sleeping. Oh. Anyway, so if there's, if you could, you know, I'm sure you and you and Nia have talked about Fred. Um, what what is what is one thing about Fred? If there's just if there is just one thing about Fred that you could pass on to Nia. Uh, that you hope that she embodies as she um, continues to grow into the you know the young woman that she is. Um, what what is one thing that if you that that you have tried to instill within her that you learned from from Fred? Hold on, Tom, just a second. We're having some tech. Hold on, Tom, just a second. We're having some technical difficulties. There you go. Okay, we can you hear know, you. Now. I mean, go ahead. our whole our whole world is um, designed to force people into snap judgments. Very, it's very black and white. There's no gray, and you know, you know. I mean, I, I even you know even even you know like a lot of like a lot of high school students, even, you know, Nia's idealism can be stated, you know, very harshly because that's the way the world is right now. I mean, I've, you know, people on my Facebook page, like, you know, I mean, you know, I've, I mean, no, you know, there are people who are, you know, express, you know, 
you know, very, very, you know, to me, the, the, you know, they're on the right side, but they express, they express some of their opinions extremely harshly. And, you know, what I, what I try to um, communicate to Nia is that you just, you, you never know, you never know what it's like to be somebody else. And, you know, try to, try to understand that before you react. I always try to, I was, I'm always trying to teach Nia to respond and not react. And, and that is, you know, that is, I think, you know, one of the things that Fred, you know, taught me, you know, um, you know, and the, and the thing that I think that Fred, the thing that Fred has taught me as a parent, and because you, I think your original question was like, what do you want to pass on to Nia from Fred? And, you know, so, you never know is, is I think the thing that I, I really want to pass on to her, but the thing that Fred passed on to me as a parent is, is, you know, you were a child once too. I mean, that is, that is to me just an incredible, you know, it's like a lot of Fred, you know, it's really simple and it's really profound. Mm. And, you know, there are just, you know, many, many moments as a parent where, you know, I am, why can't my daughter do this at this moment? And you realize, and you think back and you go like, okay, well, when I was 16, could I do that? Of course not. So, you know, my whole, my whole basis for judgment is, is, you know, has to be revised. And um, so that's, that, those are to me the main, the main things. Yeah. I, I know what, what's, what is one thing of friend that you, uh, we, we, we would like to pass on to Hazel Grace. I think it's noticing the little things. Yeah. And my I think favorite so. thing yeah. about him is, um, you know, where he, when he takes the stairs on the show, yeah. he'll go up and down them a few different times. <laughs> or he'll button his sweater differently, or he'll he'll laugh at the way he threw his shoe yeah or um and we know that the reason that he commented about the fish was for a child um who was blind but like just those little things like I'm hanging out with my fish and this is great yeah yeah the little that there's so much joy in those little moments and um they get hidden so easily mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we were, that's what we were kind of talking about before is like, you know, his, his gestures. I mean, you know, when, I mean, wonder is really as, I mean, he stood for wonder as much as he stood for kindness. Mm -hmm. And I mean, a lot of people, when you, when you ask for them, you know, okay, well, we're going to talk about Fred. So of course we're going to talk about kindness, but kindness is not, you know, it's not easy to achieve. <laughs> And, um, and I think that, that Fred, I mean, the thing that's really great about Fred is that he, he gave you tools to achieve it. Mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't like he was just saying, go, go, go on out there, kid, and be kind, you know, because that's hard to do. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that he had, had very, very kind of specific ways that he taught people to be kind. You know, what do you, you know? Pound your hand if you're mad or whatever, you know. Yeah. So we have a few questions here. Um, Tony Jackson asked this question. She said, uh, a student told me that they didn't think it would be possible for someone like Fred to be successful in today's world. And I thought that was so sad. Do you think the world would be receptive of Fred today? Yeah, I mean, I, and, and that's not to say, that's not to say that, um, you know, Fred wouldn't meet more resistance in today's world than he even did in his. And he met, he met a lot of it. Um, but I, I, I have faith that humanity um, both, you know, is, is pretty good at producing Fred's when, when we need them. And that, and that, Humanity is also, um, no matter what, will have its ear tuned to that message. Once again, I, I mean, do I think it's 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 going to be easy? No, but I think that there there are 
you know, there, there will be people that, that come out of nowhere and, and speak with the authority of kindness. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, of course, the thing that Fred had, you know, he had, he wasn't just like a nice guy. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't that. He was, he had the authority of human kindness and the authority of human kindness goes way, way, way back. Yeah. And it's a, you know, it's a tree with really, really deep roots. So I, I, I think that he, I think that there could be a Fred today. A, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Maxwell Muska, um, asked this, and he's a, he's a fellow Presbyterian pastor, says, uh, how do you think clergy can best embody Fred's legacy in their preaching and interaction with others? So, so specifically for clergy, what, what, what do you think, how can we best embody Fred's message? I mean, the, the, thing, that, the thing that Fred did, his, his great genius, was that he found um, a secular language to express sacred things, mm. right? I mean, I mean, so the thing, like his signature line is uh, you are special and there's never going to be another person like you ever, ever again. And, you know, a lot of people look at that as, oh, gee, Fred Rogers created participation trophies. That's, you know, this, the whole idea that, that everybody's special yeah. is what's haunting us right now, you know, all this privilege and entitlement. And I, what he was really trying to say was God loves you. But he found a different way to say it. And he, went, and he found a way that he could say it to anyone and everyone. Mm. and and i and i think that i think that that was the genius of him and i and it's a it's a genius that uh, you know i would i would love to see you know come out of the church because you know for the church to say jesus loves you i mean it's you know i mean that's a powerful statement but not everybody is open to that statement mm. And um, you are special, or sort of some version of that, um, can can draw a lot of people and do a lot of good. So, uh, Patsy Ann Johnson asks, "What would Fred say about dealing with climate change and species extinction?" I I think that I think that Fred would say that the the wonder. Um, that is grace i mean i think that i think that you know that that fred you know used wonder in the way that the promise of you know that that he used the promise of grace i think that they were the same for him and i think that fred would say that the the wonder of um that enables us to sort of go through and be good servants um, is predicated on the wonder of the national natural world. I don't, I don't think there is, I don't think there is wonder without the natural world. So, and I think that Fred would agree with that. Yeah. Well, Tom, as we, as we bring our our time to to a close uh, here, one of, I think uh, one of the most famous moments of of Mr. Rogers life uh, in his later, later years was when he was accepting that that big television award. I can't remember what it was. Um, and during his acceptance speech, he uh, he, he he paused and for for uh, it felt like an hour, but it was only like ten seconds or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to to ask people to uh, to to stop and think about someone. And correct me if if this is not the correct verbiage, but someone who has loved you into existence is loved existence. you into being. Loved you into being. Thank you. Some think about somebody who has loved you in, into being, um, and at, at, you know uh, it's it is it's disarming to be told to be quiet these days. Yeah. So I would like for us to close our time together by doing just that, and and not just the the three of us here, uh, but but whoever is also um, uh, watching live on Facebook. Uh, we're gonna pause. Uh, let's let's give it thirty seconds.
Okay. And you know, Fred would Fred would always hold up his watch and say, "That's right." And, and I'll count. <laughs> and I'll count. Yes. Uh, uh, so uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to pause for thirty seconds and just take a moment to dwell on someone who has loved you into being, and uh, with the, uh, you know, invite the three of us to share. And if you watching at home would would like to, after the thirty seconds, you got to take thirty seconds to uh, type in the comments uh, somebody who has loved you into being and, and, and why it is that way. So, um, so let's do that. Okay. Thank you for doing that with us. Um, Trisha, who's, who's somebody who loved you into being? Um, who were you thinking about? You know, I was thinking about my parents because becoming a parent has made me think more about growing up and my parents and how much, just how much work that they had to do <laughs> to make my life happen and the worry and the intention and the all that I feel all of that now but for somebody else and so thinking about who that person was for me um and just thinking wow that's a lot of care that it took so a lot right oh man so much yeah <laughs> I, I was thinking about a, a man, an elderly man in the church when I was growing up. His name was Elbert Shaw. And uh, every Sunday, he would walk around the church before or after the, the worship service. And he had a, a paper bag <clears throat> that was filled with little five packs of the yellow juicy fruit gum. You know, the, the yellow juicy fruit gum. And... Uh, all of us children, um, one one by one, before or after the service, would find him, and and he would just sweep us up into his arms, and he would give us a pack of a juicy fruit gum, and he would just whisper to us, "Do you, you want to know something?" And, and we all knew the answer, but we always said, "No, no, tell me." And he would just say, "God loves you, and so do I." Hmm. Um, and he did this every Sunday with all the children in the church. Um, and you know, I didn't even, I, I've never been a gum chewer. Um, I didn't even care for the gum. Juicy fruit tastes pretty good though. It does. I don't know, I'm, I'm weird, but about 10 seconds, it tastes good. About 10 <laughs> seconds, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I, I didn't go for the, for, for the gum. I, I, I went for that reminder because we all need it. And, and the fact that he took that time to individually lift up and care and hold every child. Um, that, that's a very potent memory uh, for me. Um, Tom, well, I, I, Tom how, how, about, how about you? Um, I was originally, uh, I was gonna try to think of my dad, but that wasn't working right then. So I thought of, I, I thought of, I thought of Fred um, since we're doing this and I, I still, I still can't believe that um, you know that Fred saw something in me, and that I'm doing this. That I'm you know you know talking uh, about his his legacy. It just seems it seems like you know one of the great unaccountable gifts of my life. You know, I don't, I don't even understand it to be quite, to be quite honest with you. I don't understand how it happened, how I got here. Just, I just, it's beyond understanding. But, you know, when I, when I think of, when I think of Fred, I think of, you know, then thinking of Fred got me into thinking about my dad. Um, 
because they were they couldn't have been more different but you know my dad my dad taught me um my dad taught me a lot about joy and 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 a lot about a, a lot about you know wonder and and you know him and fred were very very different but they were similar that way so well tom thank you this is great this 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 has been wonderful your your time and your presence um, is a gift for uh for for me uh trisha and i have 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 been blessed by our relationship with you and your family and and on behalf of all the folks watching um on on facebook right now uh, we are grateful for sharing your your thoughts and experiences and, and being our neighbor um, the ghost of fred rogers continues to linger without a doubt in in a, in a great way and and still still makes uh, still makes his ghostly demands so <laughs> Well, that that's that is that is something that that we need because for the months and uh, ahead of us, um, we we need to be filled with with this spirit. So um, so we have come to the end of our time together. So thank you all for everyone who's been watching. It's great uh, seeing you guys again. Yeah, so uh, gonna, I miss you, and I'm so and I'm so happy for you. I'm so 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 pleased for you. Thank you. <laughs>